Okay, well, it looks like we have enough to call a quorum. So I'm going to go ahead and begin, Steve, if you're ready. I I am, and I assume you can hear me just fine? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to go to kind of full screen. First of all, thank you for uh, jumping into the webinar today. We're excited to show you the uh, Bid Matrix product. Um, and as uh, Tony said, uh, myself, Steve Watt, and David Moyer will be doing the presentation today. A little bit of background, too, even before we get started. Um, I am located in Portland, Oregon. Uh, David uh, uh, is actually attending a conference in Colorado. Um, he's going to be uh, helping out uh, because in our kind of simulated bid day experience, uh, David is going to join in and help out, and it's a great example of uh, kind of the virtual bid room capability that is available with Bid Matrix. We're obviously not located in the same place, but as long as uh, that you know you have access to an internet connection, a team can be working collaboratively together for subcontractor bid selection. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about. The, some of the challenges that are out there in bidding work. Um, we are going to do a pretty detailed walkthrough of the product, and then we'll just review, um, come back after we're done taking a look at the product, we'll just kind of review the overall benefits. So some of the challenges uh, that we have run into, and David and I have been, I guess the two of us uh, combined, we have been uh, involved with estimating software, and you can't help but be involved with estimating software, uh, you know, without hearing about the challenges of subcontractor selection and the numbers that you're going to carry, um, and and so we know that it's a very complex process, um, and we also know that whether it's negotiated bid or hard bid, the issue of being able to analyze lots and lots of bids coming in from many many different subcontractors for each trade can be a pretty crazy kind of chaotic process. Um, and we also know specifically in the hard bid scenario, it's very challenging because so many of those bids come in at the last minute. The other thing that we've always said is, you know, closing out a bid, you know, dealing with a bid day scenario, and, and I jokingly say is kind of a team sport. So in many cases, you might have one or maybe a couple estimators working on the budgetary estimate that you would create uh, in Sage as an example. But in some cases, you need to pull in additional people to actually manage that, that you know, all that input from subcontractors that, that tends to come in at the last minute. And so you need a collaborative environment, ideally, to handle that. And the systems that are out there today and people struggle with Excel because it doesn't really support kind of that collaboration. Um, the other thing is, for a lot of general contractors, they need to be able to balance the work that they self-perform with the work that they're getting from their subcontractors. And they need to be able to see very clearly what work they've chosen to self-perform and what work they haven't. And again, that becomes another challenge someday, sometimes if you're trying to do that in some sort of a bid day Excel type spreadsheet. The other issue, a lot of cases, is you know that on any projects you've got a number of trades that you're having to deal with, and a lot of times people will set those up each as their individual, you know, bid sheet, and then you have the issue of trying to do a, a lots of last-minute merges. And most people in the course of their lifetime have been stung a few times by having to do last-minute merges. Many cases, thinking that they've merged the final uh, bid tabs and find out later they may not have actually been the finals that they brought together in one composite. So there's that, that process can be very error prone. The other thing that happens is it's difficult enough to kind of manage all those subcontractor bids coming in on the base estimate. But as you know, projects can be very complex and can include any number of alternates. So in addition to measuring the bids on the base bid from any given trade, Many times you want to be able to look at that inclusively of the bids that you would receive for those same trades on alternates. And again, systems just don't manage that very well, and yet it's a reality of, of projects and the bids that you have to submit. Um, and then 
what happens because so many of those bids come in at the last minute, you, you do your best to come up with what you believe to be the lowest possible solution, at least in a hard bid, you do that. But in many cases, it ends up being kind of your best guess. So things that jump out at you in terms of bids that maybe you shouldn't include so that you should exclude them, those kinds of things. You don't really have the time to, to analyze all the possibilities. Um, inclusions and exclusions. So not everything revolves around the bid. How do you look at those bids in the context of, of inclusions and exclusions that accompany that bid when it comes in? It's just more information to try and juggle. And again, it just adds to the challenge and complexity that comes along with, with subcontractor selection and the numbers you're going to carry. Um, knowing when to add or deduct, you know, a subcontract bid due to an inclusion or an exclusion, right? So I need to be able to level bids, you know, all the time. There may be missing scope. They, there may be something that maybe isn't tied to missing scope, but because it was left out, I need to, uh, you know, I need to level that bid with some additional dollars. Uh, you know, in 2020, a lot of general contractors basically said the idea of a physical you know, war room or a bid room has kind of gone away. People were, were forced to, in some cases, not come into the office or working from home, and yet the, the bid work needed to continue. And so how is that supported when we don't have people sitting in the same room any longer? And that's just a reality of, of what happened at the beginning of 2020. And in, me, in many cases, people are still working remotely. So, uh, you know, the existing systems out there didn't really support that kind of uh, remote collaboration. Um, and then one of the things that we always would run into, and you guys can probably appreciate this, is for years and years and years, people would, you know, convince people of the power and, and why people should move from an Excel solution for, for creating that initial budgetary estimate. So they would show, you know, Sage estimating, they would show, you know, all the various tools out there and people would say, and, and of course, at the time you're doing that, people knew that there were, you know, the issues with Excel and the possibilities of errors in, in Excel and errors in, in, in formulas and so on and so forth. And, and people would say, yeah, we need to get away from that. We need to get away from those kinds of errors that we know exist in Excel. So they would be convinced to move to a estimating tool, but invariably the, the customer and the prospect would say, show me how you close out the bid. How do, you, how do you select sub? How do you manage what could be hundreds of bids coming in from subcontractors? And in many cases at the last minute, and because there was no solution out there at the time, people would have to go back and tell those people, well, you should do that in Excel if that's the way you're doing it today. So they would use that as an excuse to kind of push that person back to Excel just for that, that piece of the work. Well, what you're going to see today is those challenges can be overcome today with the Sage Bid Matrix product. So Sage, at the end of the day, it is a collaborative bid room environment. It's, it's for both negotiated bids and hard bids. An entire estimating team can work together on a collection of bid packages. They can be working from multiple locations like you're going to see today. Um, and then, you know, they can continually update the master estimate in real time. And they can handle, you know, alternates. They can handle whole, you know, complete coverage bids, partial bids even discounted bids if, if somebody were to be awarded the entire work. So having said that, I'm going to jump out and let's take a look at the bid matrix product. So you should be seeing on your screen right now, um, I'm in the live bid matrix software right now. And the first page you're taken to when you log into bid matrix, you'd be taken into a page of your company's projects. And you see a kind of a tile view here of all of these projects. So these would be the projects that I've set up. Each one of these projects, there is a virtual bid room behind that project, which is where we actually go in and do the bulk of the work in terms of the you know, numbers coming in from subs and sub selection. But this is the first page that you would see. When you click on a project, you'll notice there's a flyout panel on the right-hand side of the screen. 
that flyout panel gives you additional information about that project. And of course, you can narrow, because over time, you could have hundreds and hundreds of projects in here. You can always archive projects. You can delete projects that you think you no longer need access to. And you can copy projects. So if you want to take an existing project and use an existing project for the starting point for a new project, you can do that as well. You can actually copy that project and all the contents of that project to create a new one. So again, this view is what we call a tile view. Now, some people want to see the same list of projects, but they potentially want to view those projects in more of a table view. So you can actually toggle back and forth between a table view or kind of a grid view of all your projects as well as that tile view. And of course, you could click on any one of these column headers, re, you know, sort the data based on any of these column headers. You could change the sequence of the columns around, do whatever you want to do. So this would be the equivalent of my project page, but just in a, t in a table view as opposed to a tile view. Okay, so now we're back to this tile view. Let's, we're gonna focus today on the Sage Headquarters project. And I've got it, you know, I clicked on it, so I have it highlighted right now. So if I click on this project and um, uh, slide over here, I see the name of the project, who's the client, important kind of high level summary information. What's the overall project size? the unit of measure for that project, I so on and so forth. The next tab over is very important. And the key here is you see things, you see fields. And for every project, you can fill these out. So you see market segment. I can see that there's actually a drop down list for the market segment, so on and so forth. And so I can see all that information here, the region. Um, I have other questions to respond to. Um, and uh, these are all user-defined fields. We call these project attributes. You can create as many as you want. And you're, we're gonna come back and loop back at the end of the presentation and show you the value of this. But in a nutshell, if I've attributed all of these projects and behind every one of these projects is our bidding information, I've actually got with Bid Matrix a complete bid history database, and I can actually access and data mine that database using any of my user defined fields as filters. Okay, and we're going to come back and look at that here in a bit. The last tab is a permissions tab. So the permissions tab basically allows you to determine which of your bid matrix users within your company you want to give access to each individual project. So when a project is set up, and let's say I've got 10 licenses of the bid matrix software, I might only need three or four individuals in the company to have access to any given project. I would click private and then limit access to that to just, you know, whichever, uh, users would have access to that project. Public does not mean anyone outside your company could get to the project. Public just means however many people have, are licensed to use BidMatrix within your company can actually access this project. Okay, having said that, let's go to where the bulk of the work gets done, which is actually in the bid room itself. So I'm gonna go into this Sage headquarters bid room. I'll just click on the bid room option here. And a couple things I'm gonna point out. This project, you can see all these numbers here. So I have a budget for every one of these trades. This is a result of actually pointing to a SAGE estimate in this case and pulling that estimate in. And we have options to you know, pull in estimates from other sources as well. But in this particular case, I've actually pointed to a SAGE estimate and pulled it in. So all this information is here. The other thing I would point out is we, we are very, very proud of the fact that we've created a collaborative bid room. So you're seeing my screen, Steve Watt's screen. I'm in Portland, Oregon. David Moyer, I can hover over here, and John Parks, I can see that they're actually in this project with me right now in real time. And I can see, and, and by the way, they're both in Colorado. And I can see that you know John Parks is in the metals trade probably entering bids in the metal trade, and David is down here in HVAC. So not only do I know they're in the project, I know where in the project they're located. Now, if you look at, as I said before, all these budgets came in from my SAGE estimate, I could have 
you know, underneath each one of these trades, I can have as many as what we call bid package phases that I want to get individual bids from my subcontractors. And you'll notice here's an example where you are in control of the level of detail. So if you look at site work and demolition, I'm just looking for one number for my site work contractors. The same for my concrete. I'm just looking for one number for my overall concrete. If I look at metals, I can see that metals I broke down in a little bit more detail. So these are bid package phases that are underneath metals. Ideally, I would like to get an individual number from my metals uh, subcontractors for each one of these. If I roll this up, I'm going to roll up these others and because I can see now that actually John Parks has joined David in the HVAC bid package, I can expand this and we'll just take a look at this here on the summary sheet. And I can see that my HVAC package includes sprinklers, plumbing, HVAC equipment, ductwork, and controls. And I'm going to join them. I'm going to go into that HVAC package and, and kind of see what they're up to. What I can see is they've been busy. They've already been adding bids for each of these bid package phases within the HVAC that you see up here. Now, again, the collaborative nature of our bid room, not only can, do I know that these guys are in the project with me, I actually can see them moving around on my screen. So I can see where they are even within a given bid package. We, we actually had one of our customers call us recently and they had just a crazy bid package. They had a concrete package that had 30 phases in it and they got bids from 35 subs for those 30 phases. They had five of their team members, their estimators in that concrete bid package, all entering bids at the same time. And they basically called us to say that they don't think they could have done it without bid matrix. So bid matrix fully supports that kind of that level of collaboration. So I know where they are all the time. Now let's talk about these bids. I can see that Harder Mechanical, Beaverton, Ivy, all these subs have given me some numbers and David and, and uh, John have input those numbers into our matrix. And I can see the different types of bids. I can see I got bids from Harder Mechanical. Harder, you could ar argue these individual bids were really helpful because later when I go to mine data for bid history, of course, it's nice to have you know dollar values all the way down to the phase level. So they gave me individual bids, which is great. I come over here to Acme. One thing I notice here, they gave me individual bids, but they did not give me a number for fire sprinklers. And most likely, they, they left that out in air. They forgot to give us a number for sprinklers. So we're going to come back and deal with that in just a minute. But I wanted to show you, in addition to these individual bids, you notice Airco Mechanical and Midstate Mechanical did not give me individual bids. So what you can do is type a total in the total cell here, and you can actually, you'll get a series of check boxes, one, one box for each phase, and you just check the boxes. You check the scope that is covered by that lump sum bid. And it could be that all your subs gave you lump sum bids. And then you just go ahead and flag the phases that are covered by that lump sum. But I need to be able to handle, remember the, the challenges we talked about, I gotta be able to handle individual bids, lump sum bids, bids that have missing scope. I can do all of those in the matrices here. Now, a couple other things before I forget. You'll, you may have noticed already, that as I click around in the matrices, so when I go from harder, like, you know, right now I've got my cursor sitting on, on a bid for harder mechanical. Notice in the lower right, I see information here, Nancy Rogers, I see the phone number, I see Nancy's email address, so on and so forth. And I see other information about this subcontractor. And this is very helpful when I'm actually entering bids in the bid day process. So whenever I add a sub, to the matrices, I know not only get to see that information here, but I get this important information here. And you may have noticed when I hover over the phone number and hover over the email address, those are live. So if I were using voice over IP, I could click on that phone number and it would immediately dial up Nancy and that would help me if I had a question about her quote and I needed to have a conversation with her. So that would be true of all these. So if I move my cursor to Ivy Mechanical, you notice the information changes. 
The other thing I would point out is how do these subcontractors get into the matrices? Well, you just click on add subcontractors. I could type in, uh, I know I have a bunch of subcontractors that have HVAC in their name, so on and so forth. I can also add subcontractors on the fly that don't exist in, the, in, the, in your local database. So you just type in a description, you say add is new, and it will not only add that to the matrices immediately, it'll also add it to the database. Now you may have noticed if you did some research on bid matrix out on the website, that another source for subcontractors is not just the local subcontractor database in bid matrix, but we also have interfaces to smart bids invitation to bid solution, building connected invitation to bid solution, and Procore's invitation to bid solution. So the reality is, if I clicked on add subcontractor, and I'll just I'll use building connected as an example, if I clicked on that, what would happen is we would know you're in the HVAC trade, it would actually look at the HVAC contractors that you sent invites to in either Smart Bid, Procore, or Building Connected, and it would actually organize those subs by who accepted the invite, who declined the invite, and who never responded to the invite. The advantage of that is I could click on the header for the subs that accepted, and it would pull all of those subcontractors in at the same time with a single mouse click. And by the way, that's where the attribute information is coming from. It's also coming from those systems if you're using those systems. So very powerful in integration to invitation to bid solutions. All right, let's look at some other things. You may have noticed that some of these phases have a shaded green background. And what Bid Matrix does all the time, every time you enter an individual bid, Bid Matrix analyzes all the possible combinations in the matrix and determines whether that bid is part of the lowest possible cost solution. So these shaded green bids are bids that would be representative of the lowest path through this matrix. Now, I'll call your attention down here to the lower left where it says path analysis, and this is where the real-time analytics is really taking place. So you notice here, the blue column was my budget coming out of SAGE. So here's the budget for every one of these phases coming out of SAGE for a total of $1.8 million. Down here it says, your lowest possible solution to this HVAC matrix is $1,576,000, which is $274,000 less than my budget for HVAC coming out of SAGE. However, you'll also notice, you notice it up here by the shaded green cells, but it also tells you down here, that low path involves five subs. Well, you're not likely to award your HVAC work to five different subcontractors. However, and, and by the way, many of you may have been surprised that there are actually 6,482 valid combinations to this matrix. That's, that's where you don't have time to analyze anywhere near that number of possible combinations, but the system can do it for you in an instant. Just like I could come here and say, I'm not interested in the lowest five sub solution. What's the best one sub solution? Well, the least expensive one sub solution is American Mechanical over here on the right. So American Mechanical, and that lowest one sub solution is $1,627,000. It's $51,000 you know, more than my lowest possible solution, but I would look at that and say, that's fine. I'll live with the $51,000 difference because I'm not going to manage five subcontractors doing HVAC work on the project. But in terms of analyzing the combinations and just showing you how quickly you can do it, if I come over here and say, well, I might be willing to split this work up between two HVAC subcontractors, what's the lowest possible two sub solution? It says, well, it would be to use harder mechanical for the sprinklers and the controls, and it would be to use Acme for these three phases. And instead of a $51,000 difference, I now only have a $3,800 difference between the absolute low and my conditional low. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna remove that and turn this back to unlimited for a minute. And then we're gonna look at some other uh, possibilities here. 
Now I can see David is doing some work. He went in and required, you notice one of these cells turned dark green. So he said, we're gonna use harder mechanicals number for duct work. We're gonna use that number. It doesn't matter whether it's low or high, we're using it. Maybe they do just such phenomenal job that we have to use that number. So he did a right mouse click and he did a require. That, that immediately becomes part of my overall path through here. He did kind of the opposite with American Mechanical. He right mouse clicked on their bid for the equipment and he did an exclusion on that equipment. Okay, so he basically said, we don't care whether that number's low or high, probably substituted the wrong equipment on the last project and we remembered that and we said we wouldn't use them for equipment again, right? So he did an exclusion. So they will no longer be in, you know, part of this solution. Now, that requirement and that exclusion is going to cost me a little bit of money in terms of the low path. And I can always see that. So in reality, I put a couple conditions on this matrices. Those conditions cost me $87,000. Once again, that, that might be fine. Those are just conditions I'm willing to live with. Um, but, and, and by the way, those are just toggles. So you can toggle them on and off and change your mind at any point in time. Okay, one of the things that we can do, let's go back and fix up Acme's you know, bid here. Remember, I told you they did not give us a number for sprinklers. So I could right mouse click here and, and notice one of my options is the supplement. When I click on supplement, what the system does for fire sprinklers, it actually reaches in and looks at my Sage item scope and says, okay, there were a couple items that are responsible for that $46,000 budget in Sage for the fire sprinklers. And it was the storage tank. And then there's some, you know, a valve system here. And that's, that's where that $46,000 came from. Well, remember, Acme, they're sitting here and they never gave me a number. So what I'm going to do for Acme, I'm actually going to click the minus key and I'm going to, I'm going to use my budget to, bid, to level the fact that they did not include that in their scope. And when I can do that, when I do that, you'll notice I get a icon in the cell here that helps me. It says, this sub did not even give me a number for this phase. My supplements represent the entire bid. And it tells me that here too, that their initial bid was zero, but now I've added $46,000 to their bid. Now, the other thing that I can do, and by the way, I can do this left to right across. So for every bid for any one of these items, if I wanted to, completely optional, by the way, but I could go in and say, hey, you know, I'll, I'll pick on Beaverton Mechanical here. Beaverton, it's not clear to me. It looks like maybe they left the valves out on their bid. I could hit the minus key and supplement their bid using the number here. Now, if I don't want to use my Sage item budget, I could just double click on that cell and say, you know what, I'm going to round that up to $6,000 just to be safe. Okay, so I still show my black minus sign here, um, and, but I can override my default values however I choose. The other thing you can do is there's a row here that just says additional supplements. So you want to add some dollars to a subcontractor's bid for fire sprinklers, but it's actually not tied to an item. You just want to add some dollars. So I could have done, gone here and said, I'm, I'm going to add another $2,000 on top of what I've already done. Okay. And you'll notice every time I do that, their current bid is now $50,595. Their initial bid, however, was only $42,000, okay? So I can see the impact of all the leveling that I'm doing here, okay? So you can kind of level bids to your heart's desire here, and you can see these, you know, across the board. Now, another option in bid matrix, we talked about managing inclusions and exclusions. In bid matrix, we refer to those as clarifications. So what I could do down here is say, uh, you know, did they, you know, the, by the way, I can have as many of these as I want. I can also import them from a template, like an Excel template or a Word template. So if you look here, here's a dashboard. If I click the minus, that would indicate that it was excluded. Green would mean that it was included. And many of these, right, there's no dollar impact. Like, did they bid the job per schedule? Was it bid per plan and spec? 
These are mostly, hey, I just have to have a checklist of things that I want my team to check these items off as they're actually going through here. And notice, uh, here's one that says, did they include the hangers? So let's pick on somebody we haven't been picking on here. So we'll take Ivy Mechanical. I have checked Ivy Mechanical that they did not include the hangers. Well, maybe I don't have an item for the hangers for my uh, fire sprinklers, but I do want to add some dollars for the fact that they seem to have left that out of their bid. So I can supplement and, and add dollars to a bid right from my inclusions exclusion. And I'll come up here to fire sprinklers and say, you know, the fact that they left those hangers out, I'm going to add another $5,000 to their bid and I'm going to accept that. And you'll notice what it did. It put my up arrow key here and it shows that I supplemented that bid by 5,000. But remember, we said people want to be able to compare bids row by row by row in terms of all the possible things. So you notice here, one of my options says clarification supplements. And I actually did level a bid based on the fact that somebody didn't include those hangers. And so now that clarification shows up here in the matrix as well as my $5,000 supplement. So here's what you need to be aware of. Any inclusion exclusion that would impact a subcontractor's bid from a dollar perspective will actually show up here in the matrices, and again, that's so that you can compare subcontractors, you know, the, the total number of plug numbers across the board, okay? Now, one of the other things too that's really important, just be aware, everywhere in the system, you can add a note. So, any kind of change, anything you wanna do, you can add notes to the system and just, you know, be able to look at these notes, so on and so forth, okay? All right, let's go to another area that we talked about, which is, was a challenge, a analyzing, uh, you know, not only the base bid, but this project's got a couple alternates. So I look here and I can actually navigate between the base bid and the alternate. So the reality is when I look at this, the fact that I see parking garage in, in the second building here tells me I have HVAC scope, not only on the base bid, which we were looking at earlier, I have some uh, HVAC scope on the parking garage. Maybe not the same phases, but there's some HVAC scope on that. And I can navigate between those. I can also expand these and, and actually look at how every one of these subs not only bid those phases on the base bid, but on each of the alternates, and I can jump to that. So I have the same kind of path analysis capabilities that I have on the base bid for each alternate. Now, you might select the subcontractor based on their, you know, the overall total for the base bid and the alternates, and you can actually sort your bids from the subs for the kind of the composite total here just by clicking on the total icon. So right now I'm sorting from low to high, but you'll notice here it's, it's helping me out saying, okay, be careful though, even though that $3.2 million looks low, I see these little warnings that says they didn't bid all five phases in that alternate. I've got some missing scope. Same with Harder. Beaverton didn't give us a complete bid for the second building. The first and lowest bid that I've got where everything was bid is Ivy Mechanical. Notice I don't have any warning here. So really, if I wanted to do this just based on my overall low, it would be Ivy Mechanical. And David David has gone in and he went ahead and said, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and select Ivy for everything. There's 3.6 million, they're, they're lowest for everything. Okay, one of the things you may be wondering, since this is a collaborative environment, you might be wondering, I got David in here, John Park's in here, I've been in here, we've been making changes, manipulating the data. Do we have a history in an audit trail of all this information? So if I look at this, you notice the last tab down here says history. Okay, and I can have a complete history of everything that I've done. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch back over to my base bid. And you'll notice that's where we've been doing the bulk of our work here. So I'm gonna come over here and look at all this work we've been doing. And I can see everything listed here. I can see that John Parks did something. Everything is date and time stamped here. I can also, uh, and notice here, John Parks just now made another change. 
So John Parks just made another change, just wrote another entry into our audit trail. I can also filter, you know, to a subcontractor phase if I wanted to. So I could come in here and say, show me everything that has to do with the bid for Ivy Mechanical for fire sprinklers. So this is everything we've done for that particular phase for Ivy Mechanical. So you've got a nice audit trail and you can also filter the audit trail and you can dump the audit trail out to Excel if you choose to review later. Okay, let's go back to our, our details here. Now I'm looking here and right now I can see we've kind of unselected. So I've got kind of a mix of bids here representing my low path. Remember, one of the things that's happening in real time, one of our challenges was that idea of trying to merge all this work together for kind of one composite bid. If I go out to my summary sheet, and I'm going to drop this down a little bit. If I go out to my summary sheet, you'll notice here that I can see my, my totals. I can also see, um, I'm going to slide this over a little bit, and I'm going to take the subcontractor total and slide this over. I can see the subs that I've currently selected. Now, I can also see that David went back just now and said, let's go with American Mechanical. So when you look at all these subcontractor numbers here, that's because we've selected American Mechanical for everything, okay, um, in real time. And at any point in time, I could say, you know, we're kind of done with that HAC trade. I'm gonna lock it down. We don't need to do any more work on HVAC. I'm happy with the numbers that I got from American Mechanical. You know, we're, we're good with that. And I can also see David just moved up here to equipment. And so I can actually see that John Parks is now up here in metals. And by the way, you can unlock a bid package at any point in time, but I would have to physically unlock it. But as long as it's locked, I can be assured that none of these numbers are gonna change and then I can redirect my team to work elsewhere. Okay, so again, just that highly collaborative environment, always knowing where they are. Now, the other thing that you can do, the system includes the ability, because you may have noticed that I've got the bids here that came in from uh, American uh, Mechanical here in this column. And I also have a gross total column. And there's a little bit of a difference between my, you might say my net dollars and my gross dollars. If I click on totals and markups and drop this down, be aware we have full markup capability in the system. You can set up percent type markups. You can insert subtotals wherever you choose. You could create a contingency markup and actually point it to a specific area in your bid. You could say, I'm gonna add a $10,000 contingency, but I just want to attribute that to my HVAC numbers. So when I go to look at this and I look at the gross dollars, HVAC would have those, that $10,000 spread across those HVAC phases. We also support bottom line markups. A bottom line markup would be a markup that calculates and then includes itself in the calculation to recalculate. Probably the best example of that is this last one, which is a real bond markup that has multiple steps. So you can do bond markups that will actually include their dollar value in the calculation of the markup. So it's actually a multi-step markup. Another thing we do is we allow you, you notice when I was in the matrices, I clicked on a subcontractor and you saw those attributes, things like, is this subcontractor a minority owned contractor? Are they a local contractor? Some of you may have to submit bids and try and achieve certain targets, certain award ratios. You can set up what we call statistics, and you can come in here and you'll notice I've got a, a statistic here that I want the system to kind of track for me as I'm using the system. 25% of this project is supposed to be awarded to minority-owned businesses. I haven't hit that number yet. Um, I, I'm not there because that, that number would be, uh, in this case, 6.4 million. I'm under that. I'm only at 21.5%. I'm green on local subcontractors. I had a 30% target. I'm fine there. I'm, I'm over that. I'm at 34% already. I don't have to worry about that anymore. But this is, this is kind of kept running for you in real time as you're actually selecting bids, you know, in the process. Um, Another thing I'd just like to point out here is there's a whole series of reports that are already set up and they're there for you. You can download those reports, make modifications to those reports, re-upload them, and they'll be available for you. That, that will allow you to see things like, you know, here's, here's an example of one of the reports, which is I want to compare my 
SAGE budget against the numbers I actually got from my subcontractors. Here's another one where in some cases, sometimes people do government work or whatever, public work, and I actually have to show the subcontractors that bid each of these trades. I have to show their numbers. I have to show who I selected. So um, all these reports are included in the system, but you can download them, modify them, upload them, and they just become part of your reports kind of drop down menu. Okay, the last thing I want to show you is I want to kind of tie this all back to what we started with. I'm going to go back to my projects page. And here's that list of projects. And I said behind every one of these projects is all of that bidding information, which subs I selected, the bids I accepted. In fact, if I click here again, remember that that tab where I have my user defined attributes like market segment, region, so on and so forth. These are all user defined. The value of that is you could mine all this data. We expose it for you to kind of data mine. If I come in here, I can look at an example of that. Here's a dashboard. You, you know that I could come in here and say, boy, I'm really curious about my average unit price across all the projects that we've created and accepted bids from subs, but I now want to filter this list down. I'm only interested in corporate office projects. So notice a bunch of projects just disappeared. I might only be interested in projects that were bid in a certain period of time, maybe projects of a certain size, maybe in a certain part of the country. So this is where you could use all of your user-defined attributes to filter that information. But I always point this out. This would be the average unit price using real bidding information coming in from your subs filtered by maybe your market segment and bid date. Think how handy this would be. Think how handy this would be when you're actually getting bids from subs. It would allow you to do kind of a real-time sanity check as you're actually looking at those bids coming in. You could maybe spot problems or errors in a subcontractor bid before it's too late and at least you know, require a follow-up to that. Another example of being able to mine that data that can help you out, and this maybe applies to some of the larger organizations on this call, is I've got another dashboard here that is also interesting. Sometimes you're bidding many projects at the same time. And you might have contractors, like a mechanical contractor, that has given you bids for all the projects you're currently bidding. And sometimes you can lose track of what their bond limit is. And you don't want to exceed their bond limit. You don't want to award them too much work because you might be on the hook for you know, any dollar value exceeding their bond limit. Well, one of the things I can do, because I have access to all this bidding information, I could click on Charter Mechanical. I could see all the bids where they're giving us numbers. I could see that the sum total of all the bids they've submitted is $15 million. I can also see that we have awarded them. We've currently selected them for 7.9. Well, I can, I can see right here, they have an $8 million bond limit, okay? So I'm, all, I'm almost at their bond limit. So I could, I, I, again, I can pull all this information together and what makes it possible is the fact that I have access to all this bidding information, you know, behind the scenes. Let's see, let me go back to our presentation here for a minute. I just wanna wrap up, kind of summarize. So again, bid matrix, Sage bid matrix is all about winning more bids, right? So I want to increase my bid to, you know, award ratio. I want to lower the risk because I don't have time to analyze. In my example, I had 6,000 valid combinations. I don't have time to analyze 6,000. I need the system to do that math for me in the background. Increase accuracy, right? Get, get rid of the guesswork. Um, I want to take advantage of the fact that, you know, I can pull estimates in from Sage. We have other estimating systems we can pull things in. We can pull from Excel. Um, and we have integrations to invitation to bid solutions like SmartBid, Procore, and Building Connected. Um, we integrate to Excel for pulling estimates in. You can pull your budgets in from Excel if, that, if that's the tool you're using for estimating. Um, it's 100% cloud-based. It's highly secure. It's all using Microsoft Azure's security platform to make sure no one can get access to your data. Um, you hopefully saw throughout the presentation what a collaborative environment it is. 
team sport, multiple people working and contributing at the same time, and no last minute merges. So you saw the summary sheet for every trade is being updated as you're actually doing the work in each one of those bid packages, right? So flexible, manage any kind of bid, regardless how the bid come in, handle all the alternate capability, uh, better visibility into inclusions and exclusions. Um, you know, and, and we know it's all about winning the right jobs at the right price, right? You don't want to get a job at the wrong price and then eat away at your profit. You also don't want to uh, not be awarded a project because you didn't have time to analyze all those possibilities. So it's hopefully you saw too that the workflow was very intuitive, so easy to learn and use the system. And at the end of the day, I haven't really talked to any contractor that doesn't have a mission to make data-driven decisions and, and use the, that information. In, in other words, we're creating a tremendous amount of bid history that bid history can help you, you know, help lead you to data-driven decisions. Okay, last but not least, David, who's been helping me out here on the call, um, please take down this information too if you have more questions um, and we can help you out. Uh, there's the contact information, David Moyer, so it's david.moyer at sage.com. There's the phone number. And if you have any questions for me, the presenter, it's Steve Watt, W-A-T-T, -T, and I'm at steve.watt, W-A-T-T, -T, at sage.com. And with that, I am going to stop talking and turn it back to Tony to see if we had any questions. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, David. Yeah, there are a couple questions that I got that um, would like to put out for you and the team. Is uh, One was in regards to the clarifications that you were showing near the end there. And the question is if those are project specific clarifications or if those are organization clarifications from project to project. So a couple, that's a great question. So a couple things, those clarifications do live with that project, but that is what, also why we put the import option in because a, a lot of our customers said, I have kind of a default list of clarifications for each bid package or each trade, and I want to be able to pull those in to each bid package, can I pull in a list, a pre-built list as a default, and then maybe, let's say I pull in 10 or 20 clarifications, yeah, I might delete two from the, my default list, and I might add two that are specific to the project, but they do live with the project. Also understand that you can, you know, I started that project by pulling an estimate in from Sage, you can build up a project from scratch in the summary sheet. So you can actually build all your bid packages and your phases directly in bid matrix. Of course, it's much more expeditious to be able to just directly pull them in from, from Sage. Um, but you can also use, have templates. You could actually point to an existing project and maybe what's in that project is a list of, it's a template of your bid packages. And within each of those bid packages, is your list of clarifications for that particular trade, you could actually point to that template and say, you know what, bring in all my bid packages and clarifications. I'll use that as my starting point. So you kind of have the best of both worlds. Clarifications do live with the project, but you could actually point to a template and pull the clarifications in and then modify them as necessary for that specific project. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Uh, another comment slash question is this looks really great and easy to use what kind of effort is involved in setting this up time frame our resources etc do we require consulting yeah great another great question so one of the things and hopefully you saw this during the presentation is we think the product is intuitive workflow is very understandable this is what our experience has been and again this is one of the things this is one of our goals we're very happy to achieve this we have people who will acquire their licenses of bid matrix on a Monday and their bidding work on Thursday. And part of the reason for that is the training. We have we typically say the training is going to be uh, up to about four hours. So two two hour training sessions and um, and then people are off and running and which is great. Um, again, we want people to be able to get benefit from the product as soon as possible. So the, the training and uptime is, is very, very quick. 
Okay, thank you. And the final question is, is for application help being web-based, are we gonna have to use uh, Sage University or do you have your own help? Yeah, so one of the things that you've got on every page in the bid matrix software, there's a little help icon up here. If you click on that, it's actually going to jump out to an entire knowledge base where the entire system is documented. So if I click on the word knowledge base here, you'll see a whole series of how-to uh, options here, right? So if I, I uh, started to type in a search for clarifications, for example, deleting a clarification, adding a bid package clarification, which you saw me doing. So here is all the information you need for how to import and how to set up a clarification. So the entire system is documented through the help system. Excellent. And that was the only question or the final question I wasn't able to answer myself. So um, yeah. thank you. Thank you again, Steve. Thank you, David, in the background. And thank you to our attendees. I appreciate everybody's time today. And I hope everybody has a great day. Great. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Take care, everybody. Thank you.